we can learn to rest in you as you rest in us. May we find the access to that rest here and now to be easy to locate light. And we thank you, Jesus, for showing us the way, for being the way. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Shayla, you want to come up and read this here passage of scripture? Want to borrow this? Oh, here. Make some room for you. Just a second. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have put him. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. She told them that he had said these things to her. Ah, well, happy Easter, guys. What's, uh, what do you, um, what are you present to in yourself? What do you notice about that story? What do you notice about yourself hearing that story? Does anything stand out that feels like you'd like to share with us? Yeah, yeah, she saw him, but she didn't see him. And what caused or enabled or made it click for her when she when she was able to see who he was? It was when he said her name. The angels in the tomb. In the tomb, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's <laughs> brushing off the angels. Yeah, all right, she must have noticed them because she reported it. <laughs> Didn't make her stop crying. It's interesting. You see, you see Christ's statement um, of ascension not as a sort of something he's up to, not only as just something he's up to, but as some kind of an invitation to ascension for you as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
do not cling to me, says Jesus. Oh, man, what are we supposed to cling to? It's kind of like a best case scenario clinging situation there, I think. Follow me. Don't cling to me. Follow me. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we've got we've got a little teaching in three parts here, and this is uh, this is part one. It's called the crucified God. Uh, this is from First Corinthians. It's Saint Paul. He says um, he's basically lamenting. He's been he's been delivering this message for a while, and this is uh, these are the most common resistances, I guess, that he's found. He says, uh, you know, the Jews demand signs, they want miracles, and the Greeks look for wisdom, they want to know what it means. Uh, But we preach Christ crucified, and have found that to be a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. A a few years back, my sons and I became acquainted with the Greek pantheon of gods from this, um, this sweet little podcast called Greek and Out. And um, we must have spent 100 hours listening to stories about um, various Greek gods. It's a, great, it's a great show. I think it's National Geographic. And over the course of sort of becoming, you know, marginally familiar with the Greek conceptualization, conceptualizations of the divine, I, um, I can see why the concept of a god who would willingly submit to the humiliation of crucifixion at the hands of puny mortals would make, like, no sense. Um, I'm not sure if it makes much more sense to us now. It's just familiar. Um, but to the sort of, like, value system that undergirded all these stories here in ancient Greece, uh, do you know what the number one virtue was? And it, what, what, do you, what do you suppose... Um, what's this culture's primary virtue? At least that we, you know, espouse. What do you think? Is it prosperity? (laughs) Influence and prosperity are interesting to think of as virtues, yeah. Is it virtue itself? Hmm. Hard work as a virtue. This is this is interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, I think I was probably trying to give us the benefit of the doubt and figured we'd say, like, love, you know. Um, but you guys are on to something here. I think, you're, I think this is a little more accurate. So, um, love, yes. Thank you. Exactly. That's the right answer. Um, <laughs> well, what about a couple thousand years ago, you know? Like, we're sort of the culmination of Western culture, or at least the current culmination of it and possibly the end of it. Um, what do you know about Greek culture? Or do you, maybe you don't need a quiz. This one seems like I'm holding. I actually have an answer for this, so I'm just going to say what it is. I, I learned not too long ago that the um, primary virtue in Greek, ancient Greece, what was considered to be the pinnacle, it was um, persuasion. Isn't that interesting? Kind of a and the reason for that was they saw that persuasion could um, uh, was was a means of avoiding conflict, basically. And a way to avoid war was to be able to persuade the other side to, you know, see it the way you do. And I feel like it's kind of interesting to think about where we are now, two thousand years later, with like uh, just sort of like saturated in this like marketing culture. It's like persuasions kind of gotten out of control a little bit. But the cultural values that produce the kind of stories of the Greek pantheon of gods, the primary aspects uh, that were idealized were sort of like valor, strength, persuasion, persistence. And so to come across a picture of God preached for the not just the message of Christ, but for the demonstration of his life to be these primary virtues of self-sacrificial love expressed through surrender. The idea of a crucified God. It's pretty far out. Now, that term crucified God is a phrase that was coined by a guy named Jürgen uh, Moltmann. He was a soldier in the German army during World War II. And he was a POW in an English war camp 
And he was given a copy of the New Testament, and when he read the cry of Christ from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He writes, he thought immediately, now here's somebody who understands me. So the cross comforts in strange ways, and it extends its comfort to us um, only as we find that we're able to acknowledge the way that it challenges our conceptions of God as omniscient or all-powerful or out there somewhere or, you know. Well, most of the pictures of God that were most... Lee, the guy that founded this church, had a, had a, um, a thing he used to say kind of often. He'd, he'd say, um, there, are the thing, there are things that we say we believe, and behind those are the things that we think we believe, and behind those are the things that we actually believe. And those top two layers can make it sort of challenging to come in contact with what we actually believe until what happens. Yeah, right. Life explodes in some way. And so I feel for a couple of thousand years, the message carried to the West in the church was this self-revelation of God as uh, the nature, the essence of God being self-sacrificial love. And yet still there's this fear that 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 love has an end point or that it's a temporary reprieve and that eventually we're going to get what's coming to us or they're going to get what's coming to them. That, that God is love, but that God also has a pretty mean sort of like vengeance streak. I remember somebody, uh, I heard somebody say one time that they felt like they had internalized the gospel message, which is that God loves you because of Jesus. Um, <laughs> they'd internalized it like this. They, they said, uh, have you ever... You ever had a friend whose dad was really scary, and every time you hung out with their dad, he just, like, made you nervous and uncomfortable, and, like, as long as your friend was sitting next to you in the room, you felt marginally okay, but if your friend was like, I'm going to go get a soda, and it's just you and dad. It's like, I realize that all this Christianing has left me in a place where that's how I feel about God. So, I don't know. Among many things, what the cross seems to communicate is the suffering of God. With us, through us, and even as us. Because when we see Jesus, whom the scriptures call the exact representation of God, the image of the unseen, the image of the invisible. When we see the image of the invisible upon the cross, and we see it's the revelation of the Supreme's complete unilateral identification with each of us. God's presence in us and to us, in our joy and also in our suffering, God's presence in us and to us, in our experience of union, oneness, being held, but also, and maybe more mysteriously, God's presence to us in our experience of separation, God's present to us in God's absence. <laughs> yeah, what do you hear there? Any any reflections? God is present to us in his absence. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Corey says it's far out and Jess says it's far in. <laughs> and far in. And far in. It's one of them both ands. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's standing right next to Mary, and she's looking everywhere for him. And she can't see him until she sees him. Mm. 
Makes me wonder what's causing the separation. <laughs> mm. yeah. He says, Mary, she can't see him until she sees herself, but she needs his help to see herself. <laughs> yeah, so some years back, I stumbled upon this, uh, something called the Nuremberg Chronicle, and it's this, like, illustrated encyclopedia that people used to sell door-to-door. I don't know if they did that. It was in the 15th century when it came out. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a history of the world from the beginning of it until the end of it. They illustrated the end of the world in the 15th century. So we've been trying to figure out what that's going to look like for a long time. We might be closing in on it. I'm not sure. It's hard to say. And at the beginning of uh, the Nuremberg Chronicle, there are these beautiful painted woodcuts. Are they up there? Yeah. Yeah, I love these things. Um, I love those circles so much that for a while I was going to see if Corey would tattoo one on my arm. But I couldn't. I had this hang-up that I didn't want to put it on my skin forever because I didn't like how, um, how God's hand, this sort of like the hand of the creator, is outside of creation. Do you see that? It's always like doing this. And I feel like... Um, my hang-up was that it's kind of reinforcing that idea of God out, out there somewhere. What's that song? What's that popular song? I don't know. God, God. <laughs> Just a stranger on a bus. Now, I was thinking, um, uh, God is watching us from a distance, you know? You like that? <laughs> Did it? I, yeah, I felt like I'd... I nailed that. Thank you. <laughs> you know, God is watching us from a distance, and he's got his little, his little finger there, and you're just like, I hope he keeps creating stuff with that and not smiting me, you know? And, and I, honestly, I, I've had this on my wall in my office for probably a year or more, and I just noticed, like, in the last month, that that same hand, you guys already see it, that... It's there on the outside of creation, and here when, when this God figure is, is pulling at him from the dirt, or Eve, I don't know who that is, the, the, the same hand is, is within creation. And so whatever God is and wherever God is, the scriptures from the very beginning seem to try to communicate to us in as many ways as possible that, um, that there is no separation. That, that God's closer to us than we are to ourselves. That God is at home. It's us who've gone for a walk. that it's actually impossible to wander so far that there's, there's no way home, that the way home is here and now. And that when Christ appeared on the scene 2,000 years ago, his opening remarks, his first recorded words in the scriptures, the time has come, it's now. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, it's here. Metanoia, which we say repent. But as Corey said, it means go beyond the mind and believe the good news, which is to say the mind does a masterful job at believing the bad news. And that's because it's a survival machine. So all our sense of separateness comes from the mind. And our mind has one job. It's to keep us alive, to keep the sort of separate self a viable option. And the message over and over again is repent, metanoia. See that there is life outside, around, deeper than, within, beyond. The paranoia. Paranoia means with the mind. <laughs> paranoia, para means alongside. Isn't that interesting? And so in this little picture, we have uh, a depiction of, of the all-powerful, right, the supreme, the divine. Uh, not as a sort of warring king or a, um, 
mystical force or as something separate and away, but just like as a friend in a garden. And whose pinnacle achievement was like resting with the people he loved. <laughs> After all that hard work, you know. Uh, on the seventh day, the, the number of completion. Is the act of just like taking it easy with the people you love. <laughs> All right, let's move to part two. Uh, this is called, uh, part two is called A Tale of Two Perspectives. This is a, just a rapid history lesson, okay? So about a 1,000 years ago, in 1054, the uh, Eastern Christian, what we call the Orthodox Church over here, and the Western um, Roman Catholic Church, so this is before there were Catholics and Protestants, so there, were, there, there was one church. And then in 1054, that one church split into the Eastern and Western churches. And uh, they split decisively. The Western Pope actually excommunicated the Eastern Patriarch, and the Eastern Patriarch then excommunicated the Pope. And you got one of those, like, you can't fire me, I quit situations. Um, and do you know what the disagreement was over? I'll give you a hint. It was, um, it, was, uh, it was theological in nature. They almost always are. Uh, saved by faith alone. Seems important. That wasn't it. What's it? A woman. A woman? <laughs> mm-hmm. It was Helen of Troy. <laughs> um, now, here's what they split over. Um, uh, let's see. The Eastern Church believed that the Spirit um, proceeded from the Father... Oh, no, sorry. The Western Church believed that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father, and the Eastern Church believed that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son. <laughs> yeah. So that, that somehow, I mean, I'm sure some other things led up to it, but that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And it was the first time that the church split, and it split in such a messy way that it had the leaders, um, you know, publicly <laughs> excommunicating one another. And that split over that theological situation there, um, uh, the mutual excommunications weren't lifted until 1965 because it was the 60s, and... Uh, <laughs> so that was like a thousand years a thousand years of almost no communication between the church of the east and the church of the west and almost no, little to no curiosity we can find um, close to zero correspondence between the thinkers in the east and the thinkers in the west there was just a whole lot of skepticism and an advice to stay away from those guys because they're heretics and so this tradition which was you know a thousand years old at this point um, has spent half of its life just Christianity, um, developing at different places on, on you know, opposite ends of the globe, different cultures, different expressions, with almost no communication as to how it is that we are interpreting and understanding whatever it is that we're experiencing. Okay? So we're only, now, when, when we're the 60s, I feel like they just happened. <laughs> So a lot can happen in a thousand years, and uh, f just for our purposes this morning, talking about Easter and the resurrection, um, it's really interesting to see how the Church of the West and the Church of the East came to some, um, not opposing, but very different understandings regarding the meaning of the resurrection of Christ. What does Christ's resurrection mean to you? What, what is it that we're, what are we doing here today? C celebrating party. party life he made all things new. celebrating life and the fact that he made all things new life everlasting, life everlasting. hmm if christ doesn't come back to life we're not here nobody 
this year? Look, it's surrender to living. Love. Mm. Returning to the garden. And practicing uh, the presence. Roberta, you said he makes all things new? How many, how many things? All the things? Mm. Gratitude and faith. Hmm. That simplifies it. Say again? Uh, it's an orientation of death to... Uh, Yeah. yeah, it's a reminder of the cycles of life, the ultimate pattern, which is just that um, new life proceeds only from, from death. We don't get to it without, we don't get the one without the other. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. It's an acknowledgement of this mystery and it's so familiar to, to most of to most of us. You know, we grew up hearing these stories, but like they're they're wild story. Annie Dillard's got this line where she's like, I don't know what we're doing in church. Like we're we're dressing up in pretty clothes and trying to look nice and singing the songs and hearing the story and going home. She's like, They should be handing out helmets. Like it's like we're playing with dynamite. None of this makes sense. This is not safe at all. <laughs> And it's also a testament to, like, how there's something, even just in a lifetime, it's amazing what we can get used to, you know? Like, I had doctors performing a minor surgery on me one time, and I was awake, and they were down there doing their little surgery thing, and they, they uh, were talking to each other about this restaurant they'd just gone to in Ponte Vedra. And did you try the oysters in this? And I'm like, ah! You know, I'm like... <laughs> it's amazing what we can get used to. And then the things we get used to, we usually take for granted. And it drains the mystery, which does not resolve. This is not the kind of mystery that is solved. It's the kind that is explored. So just real quickly, I want to move through some, um, some of the representations of the resurrection uh, in the West first, and then in the East. And... Um, I went to Manatee Community College right out of high school. Yeah, took that 2.2 GPA straight into the community college. Couldn't believe they let me in. Quickly realized I didn't have to go to class, so I didn't go to many classes, even though I was paying for them. I was a bright boy. Um, and uh, the only class I regularly showed up for I never missed was art appreciation, so I feel uniquely qualified to lead us through this next portion. Um, in almost all Western art depicting the resurrection, Jesus emerges from the grave triumphantly, magnificently. In some images, the guards are being thrown back by his power. You see this one guy? He's kind of, oh, he can't see his face. But he's kind of doing what that guy's doing. He's sort of cowering. Um, in some images, the guards are sleeping. They're covering their heads in fear. Um, in some, Jesus looks like... I know you probably shouldn't do some, like make comments like this, but he just looks so much like he scored a touchdown. That one on the left, you know, it's like, um, I did it. <laughs> mm. um. Yeah, 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 he is, man. Look at those well defined pecs. <laughs> I'm just waiting for my resurrection body. Until then, I'm eating, <laughs> I'm eating pasta carbonara. <laughs> 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 
in every single depiction of the resurrection in the West that I could find or that I've ever heard of, Christ emerges from the tomb totally alone, which is kind of how the story goes. You know, it's kind of what you can find a bunch of friends in there. Uh, but when you contrast it to how the East has processed, internalized, and expressed uh, what this mystery points towards, um, it's, it's, it's very different. In the, in the Eastern Orthodox images of the resurrection, Christ is shown emerging from the realm of the dead, and he's holding the hands or the arms of Adam and Eve, which is a symbolic stand-in for all of humanity, and as he steps out of the grave, he leads them out with him. And in many, there's this just whole parade of humanity that's following Christ out of the mouth of death. You see the beast there? And what they seem to catch or understand or experience was that maybe we resonate so deeply with this story, maybe we feel it so viscerally, maybe we get together every year in droves, because at some foundational level, maybe even below our ability to comprehend or see it, we feel that when, when Christ stepped out of the tomb, you did too. And a lot of the icons you see um, bound up, this figure of, of Hades, there's this little gremlin down here, you see him? And Hades was the personification of death, the gatekeeper of the prison house of death, the, the point of no return. Showing that there's no separateness in life and there's also no separateness in death. And scattered everywhere and, and most of them you can see it just here at the, at the very bottom of the one on the left. You know, there are these locks and bolts and bars and crashed-in gates, and everything's all shattered. And, and what these represent is the power of sin and death. Sin, interestingly, uh, the Greek word for sin is ha, martano, ha, a, cancels out whatever comes next. Martano means uh, a, a part or a portion. Sin, if you just direct translate it from the Greek word, uh, the language of, our, of the New Testament, the word means not a part, to feel as though we are not a part of the whole. And so what these icons seem to want to show us is that, that all of our ingrained compulsions, that our patterns of thought and action, that come together to make up what we sort of call ourself, and our sins, our experience of separateness, and our perpetuation of the illusion of separateness has somehow already been exposed and disarmed. And we're free. You know, whether we see this as literal, actual event, or metaphor, symbolism, It doesn't change or alter the message at all. It's, Revelation says, this is Revelation 13, 8, it says, before the foundation of the earth, the lamb was slain. So before the earth was made, Christ died and resurrected, this seems to say, which means that this wasn't like plan B because plan A was handed off to <clears throat> humankind and we messed it up. Uh, like God lives in time somehow and is sort of having to figure out how to adapt to what we're doing. It's a, it's a pattern. And that when from the cross, Christ said, it is finished, well, this must mean at least partly, that we can stop living as though it isn't finished. And that there's somehow something expected of us before this internal freedom can be experienced. So 
So what are you, what are you present to here? Is there any, any reflections anyone would like to offer? <laughs> yeah, it's like kind of like good news, isn't it? It's like maybe good news for all people, even. <laughs> um, this is part three. It's a conclusion. It's, uh, it's the pattern of resurrection. St. Paul, um, uh, he, he, he calls it this in his letter to the Philippians. And, and what he seems to say is that the path of liberation is a willingness to, to join Jesus in suffering. He says, you know, I want to suffer. I actually desire it. Which is a little masochistic unless you look at the whole picture. He says, to, to join Christ in his suffering so that I might also take my place in the pattern of resurrection. The pattern is occurring over and over and over again. Moment to moment to moment. Person to person to person. Uh, this is Richard Rohr. He said, I define suffering. Here's my working definition for suffering. It's uh, whenever you feel like you're not in control. Just test that out. Apply that to a few situations. So we could say the suffering isn't what's happening to us. It's the story that we're telling ourselves about what's happening to us and the reasons we're figuring out why it's happening and the plans and schemes and ways to make it stop happening and everything and all the stuff to keep it away, to push it away. So maybe this is an encouragement. Um, it's definitely an odd thought. I, I, uh, it came to me this morning that in a way, we join Christ in suffering every time we attempt to stay in control. That even our best attempts to stay in control, which is not the right thing to do. You know, you're supposed to be let go, let go. You ever gotten to that thing before where you're like telling yourself not to do anything and telling yourself to let go and then you're like making another thing to do that you're not doing very good at, which is not doing anything and letting go. It's like the Sabbath, you know? It's like on the seventh day God said to rest and we're like, we better follow that rule. We're going to get in trouble. <laughs> Even turn rest into a thing to do. <laughs> what are we doing? Well, we're causing suffering for ourselves is what we're doing, and in some ways that binds us to Christ, even though we're doing it in a silly way. And even though we feel like maybe it's a different kind of suffering, the truth of reality is that all suffering is the same suffering. It's just wearing different clothes. So to take our place in the pattern of resurrection is to be willing to see how and where and why. Just to have some self-awareness. To keep an eye on, um, on our proclivity to attempt to control, you know, everything. And to begin to see the control for the illusion that it is, that we are never actually in control, that this whole thing is a just a runaway train, you know? Who knows what's going to happen next, now, later, yesterday, here. It's all, <laughs> and it's okay. <laughs> but to take our place in the pattern of resurrection is to learn how to see our, to come to know ourselves and to see where it is and why it is and how it is, that we are still attempting to maintain some kind of, well, really some kind of sense of separateness from the whole. And then to learn to ask, 
to develop the instincts to, and first to develop the desire to, to let go consciously, to see what it is, to let go of it, to, to willfully instead learn to rest in God who's resting in us. And the strangest thing is that learning to let go feels exactly to some part of us like dying. When my grandma passed away, we found a note, and on it she'd written, I'm not afraid of death. It's pretty brave. I'm not afraid of death, but I am afraid of dying. She'd made peace with wherever the passage led, but the passage itself had her concerned. And this is true in spiritual terms as well. You know, we long for new life. We long for resurrection, but we're a little bit frightened about the path that's going to take us there, and that's all right. That's part of it. And in time, we begin to realize that we, we join in the salvation parade in the exact opposite way of, I suppose, the way that we would think it occurs. I have to behave in the right ways or believe in the right things or belong to the right group. Or There's, there's got to be something that I have to do. I feel like the New Testament is kind of funny. I had a little chuckle about this one time when I was, like, the, the whole message just keeps saying, it's grace, it's grace. There's nothing you need to do. There's nothing you need to do. And at some point, we were like, well, okay. So it's not about my behavior, then it must be about my beliefs. And it's still just a function of ego control. And it's a lot harder to control what you believe than it is to control how you behave. You ever thought about the term make-believe? I don't know that we can make-believe. Not that what we believe is unimportant, but... We begin to see that we join in the salvation parade through the acknowledgement of our weakness rather than the masking of it, through the offering or receiving of forgiveness rather than withholding forgiveness. You know that weird little juicy energy you get from that, you know? Feels a little bit like control. I'll forgive when I'm ready. Choosing love, which is nearly always a surrender. <laughs> hmm. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with, with this. I'm going to wrap this thing up. Corey, if you want to come up, don't mind. Yeah. That's all it is. <laughs> Out of the head and into the heart. Mm. <laughs> to listen to the heart and not our thoughts. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. And thank you guys for everything you shared. It's beautiful and it actually if I try to go through this little conclusion I wrote I'd just be like re-saying all the things that you already said so I'm going to leave it with this with this slide here and um, this is St. Paul he's he, he's quoting something from from the Old Testament and he says uh, this is what the Lord said in the time of my favor I heard you and in the day of salvation I helped you and this is what Paul says I tell you now is the time of God's favor And now is the day of salvation, (laughs) the eternal, ever-present now. Yeah, so we're going to conclude our our time together. Um, There's all these flowers down here at my feet, and um, uh, you can sit and reflect for as long as you'd like, but whenever you're ready, if you'd like to participate in this, you can just come up and grab a flower. And hanging on the cross here, see the cross is wrapped in this in this mesh, and we're going to cover it with flowers by the time we're done here. 
This is a symbolic act, and I'm not going to tell you what the symbolism is. I'll let you work it out for yourself. Um, but I will encourage each of us to pay attention to what we're doing as we approach the cross and as we pick up a flower and as we place it on the cross. Just pay attention to your why. That might be important. And you're welcome. Uh, the communion elements are available here on this table. Um, so you're welcome to take and eat. And um, and that will officially conclude our Easter gathering together. So, so whenever you're ready, come on up. The table's open. The flowers are free, just like the gospel. Thanks for being here.